Hi there. I'm Salim Ismail from Singularity University. I'm here with Michael Globter, who's our track chair for energy and ecological systems. Uh, Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. So I've got a bunch of questions around energy. There's a lot of policy work that's happening this year. would love to ask you, first of all, what are the major breakthroughs that you see happening in the next few years coming up in energy? Well, I mean, I think there are kind of two. One is sort of the social revolution going on in the energy field, that people get it, that people are starting to make big transitions at an industrial level, at a social level about energy. Um, you know, the price of oil in the, in the United States went through the roof last year. But despite the fact that it's lower, I think people are really ready under a new administration, under the pressure of global warming, of energy independence, to make really deep investments in, uh, in really different energy systems. I think there's a tremendous amount of consumer rep receptivity. Uh, the corporate world absolutely gets it. Um, you know, the last few weeks have seen the defections of some of the country's most important companies from uh, a Neanderthal positions that the core of sort of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has taken. So I, I think we're seeing a big sea change in attitude. Um, and energy is a lot about attitude. Um, there's a lot of illogical stuff out there that if we can align our, our, our the consumer mindset, the industrial mindset, and the innovation mindset, we can go a very long way. It's one of those fields where I do think you can turn on a dime with the right popular environment and the right economic environment. And when do you see um, a major alternative energy um, taking bite, having a bite on the on the on the systemic issues we have today. Yeah, I mean, I think there are really two answers to that. One is incrementally, but more rapidly. You look at the last uh, five years; you've seen 20 percent growth year over year in, in the growth of the solar industry in the United States and installations. Um, but that's still incremental given the scale of the challenge we face. Uh, Al Gore called uh, just before the election to decarbonize the U.S. economy in 10 years. That is entirely feasible, and the question is whether we'll do it. Um, we have the technology in We have the technology. Uh, we have the know-how, uh, and the price is not at all prohibitive. Uh, one of the things I did here at S Singularity as an exercise with the students was I asked, you know, all the fossil fuel in the world was formed over a 100 million year period. Uh, and, I, and I had them calculate how many days of sunlight that fossil fuel represented, because that's what fossil fuel is. It's a, a battery stored from 100, several hundred million years ago right. of, of sunlight. Any well, answer? that 100 million years of sunlight uh, amounted to a total of five days worth of available fossil fuels, and we've used one day's worth in all of human history. Wow. So all, all Wait, the let problems... Me just, let me yeah. just get my hand, head around that. Uh, solar energy in five days, if we could trap it all, right. provides Produced. us the equivalent of the last hundred million years of all fossil fuels since the beginning of time. Well, all fossil fuels Basically. since the beginning of time were formed by a total of 100% capture on five days of sunlight. Wow. And so all the we, fossil fuel you, we've used adds up to one day of sunlight. Right. I mean, we've heard Ray talk about this m many times, that if we could capture one hour of sunlight, that would pr provide uh, easily 10,000 hours of, of for the Earth, Absolutely. basically. Okay. Absolutely. Um, how, how close are we to actually being able to, tra to break through uh, uh, some of those barriers in the efficiency around solar panels and so on? I think we're there. I mean, I think it's functionally a cost. I mean, the technology's there. It, there's a lot of room to get it cheaper, to make it faster. A lot of the nanotechnology is central to it. I mean, we're in a situation technologically where we can sort of print solar panels like paper. Um, uh, they aren't super efficient, but frankly, at 3% efficiency with that much energy coming in, we'll be doing very well. So I think the way the world will look and can start to look is, you know, you can just walls and windows, literally transparent windows that are solar collectors as well. Uh, and again, I, I think the technology is here. The question is whether the will is here, whether we can shift the technology to be cheap enough and to be deployable fast enough. Right. Now, when do you see, you know, we're living in an archaic grid system. Mm -hmm. When do you see the grid being updated to have smart metering and other types of things, uh, yeah. the grid 2.0 world? When yeah. does that happen? Well, I mean, what's interesting is there's two kinds of grid 2.0, right? There's a grid that is not archaic that is high-tech and allows long-distance transmission of high-voltage DC or superconducting transmission or hydrogen transmission as a battery form. But then there's, then there's sort of grid 2.0 in the archaic grid. And it turns out that the most important investment we can make is in simply making each isolated grid itself more effective and more efficient. And those are the technologies that you, I think you can drive more quickly into the consumer market with less capital investment. It does involve a lot of what's called smart grid technology. But what's interesting is the smart grid is making the existing kind of dumb grid able to handle vastly increased loads and new, more decentralized sources of supply. So essentially you implement the smart grid down at a localized level. First. And little by little come into the center. Right, exactly. Uh, is this kind of one of the principles that Bob Metcalf talks about in his internet talk? Um, I mean, I think, I think certainly 
in everything having to do with energy, the more we introduce sort of packetized thinking, the better. Right. That's true for one of the companies that maybe started out of Singularity, Get Around, which yep. is really thinking about packetizing human transportation. Um, that's true for modules of energy use, modules of energy delivery, modules of energy supply and demand. Um, so I think that's absolutely absolutely accurate. Uh, the question is, what's the throughput? Right. Uh, what, what, what are you actually trying to move more of? And I think we have to keep our eye on the ball that it's not energy, but that it's the things that energy give us, like information, like lighting services, like heating services. Uh, the end uses are what's important. So we have a bright world ahead of us. Oh, much better than the one we live in today. I mean, there's a huge cost we all pay for the fossil fuel economy every day in our pocketbooks, in international security, threats, in pollution. Um, and the beauty of it is that we're headed towards a world that's much better. And, and the entrepreneurs and the inventors have to really keep that in mind. We have to remember that positive image. Most of us do. It's what motivates, what motivates most of us. And to flip it around just for a second, what keeps you up at night? What do you worry about the most? What do I worry about the most? Well, um, I, I worry about um, uh, lack of imagination. I really worry about, I mean, one of the reasons I'm, I'm glad to be working at Singularity, uh, as much as I'm not always kind of the most sci-fi kind of guy in my thinking, is that I think it's really important to keep uh, people's eyes on the prize and to really push for what's possible. That's uh, the only way we're going to solve this problem. And when people um, fail to do that, when they think about the conventional, they lock us into that worst world that we're kind of already in and, and keep us from that much better world for our kids, for, our, for ourselves. So you ran a fascinating workshop this afternoon on carbon trading uh, between a mock uh, third world country or developing nation and uh, several first world countries. Uh, I, we have a general opinion around here that a political solution to climate change may not be feasible, that we will have to find a technological one. Yeah. Uh, after talking to some of the students, the, the general consensus was that they felt more that way. How do you feel? Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I guess I don't think it's an either or. I mean, I think the, the reality is that I think the technology to solve the problem is here today, uh, and we got to be using more of it. Um, cell phones are a great analogy, right? Where the technology to solve the problem for communications in, in, in developing countries is here today, and the question is how do you get more of them out more cheaply? I think that's true for energy use in the developing, in the developed industrialized world, as well as in the developing nations. Um, I, I, you know, I guess it's a great question. I mean, I think. Um, uh, you know, there, the problem is every, all technology carries with it politics. Right. Um, if the technology we invent, um, uh, I'm sorry, if the technology we invent weans us 100% tomorrow from fossil fuels, you don't think we'll have a political problem? I mean, the, the Saudis are already saying, how are you going to pay us to not sell this stuff? Right? They have a lot of cash reserves, and if their economies collapse quickly, the world won't get better. So we have an interesting problem. Um, and I think, so I think even technologies that, that give us the option to solve the problem overnight have political ramifications. So I, I just don't see it as an either or. Okay. Uh, let me throw you an example that came out of the, the team projects. Um, one of the, our students, uh, who's a quantum computing expert, made a reasonably compelling case that within 10 years we'll have superconductivity via super quantum computing, so which completely changed the game at a number of different levels. Give us an example of, of something that's incredibly exciting that could happen in the next few years. Um, okay. <laughs> Give me a second to think about that. Um, uh, well, I mean, I think, I think that one of the things I'm most excited about is giving people control over their own energy fate. Um, and I, I would say there's sort of two kinds of innovations that excite me the most. One is um, so the uh, availability of, of solar at a much lower price and the ability of people to sort of paint it on any surface they want or plaster it on any surface they want. Making that ubiquitous is really exciting to sort of make the planet, you know, make all of us on the planet able to sort of just harvest that amazing resource we already have. So solar paint, when does that come online? When can I kind of go to the store, buy a paint, and then... I think solar wallpaper is a decade, less than a decade away. Solar paint, I'm not really sure yet, but solar wallpaper is less than a decade away. Wow, and that's then, fabulous. Yeah, and then I think um, on the other side is transportation. Uh, and I think things like get around and the idea of really getting people out of the headset of, uh, you know, my car is my means of transportation to more information is my means of transportation. Knowing who's going where, when, is how I get around. What service is available, what taxi is available, what friend's available, what friend's car is available. And really making us much more mobile at a much lower environmental cost. So, Michael, one last question. If I'm an entrepreneur and I, and I wanted to do a startup in this space, in the energy sector, what would you suggest I do? 
<laughs> what would you do? <laughs> what I if, do as an entrepreneur in the startup space, uh, energy sector. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me how they can make some money. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I would say I, I, I think. So I can I can uh, I, I hesitate to make a specific technological recommendation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, a te specific technological bet. Um, what I'll say is this. Let me just give the answer I normally give, which is, um, you know, we're looking at the biggest we're looking at the biggest uh, switch out of technology in human history. Uh, Energy is a huge part of our economy, um, and you look at what formed the fortunes of the last century: the Rockefellers and the Mellons and all those guys who basically used land and oil to build un incredible fortunes. The fortunes of, of the end of the last century was information. I think energy is coming back, and I would urge, I think, I think people in the field have a huge opportunity, almost an obligation, to kick ass economically. There's a huge amount of money to be made in moving us to a more sustainable form of energy. There's industrial buyers. There's myriads of solutions out there that one could jump into. The, time pay, the, pay, um, the payback time is getting shorter for the investment in technology. I think the, the question that's out there still is, um, what's the payback time for the investors in the company? Um, I don't think we understand quite yet. You know, we kind of get biotech, we get high tech. The exit in energy may be seven years out, it may be 15 years out in terms of investment. Um, but that being said, there are going to be hu there are huge opportunities, and I think it's almost the obligation of entrepreneurs in the energy sector to think big, to think like the next John D. Rockefeller, um, because without that, we're not going to. You know, the, the companies that John D. Rockefeller built are still around, and they're not going gently into that good night. So in Silicon Valley, you might be a software company and you say, I'm going to kill that competitor. Uh, well, if you're an energy entrepreneur at your heart, you have to feel like you're going to kill Exxon. Uh, that's what John Dewar and Vinod Koshla say when they close their speeches. They say, they'll kill oil and coal. That's how big energy entrepreneurs have to think. Hmm. Wow, well, I hope this is the right place for people to have Absol that kind of vision. Ab absolutely. They have to think cutting edge. They have to think leapfrog. They have to think uh, jump over your opponent and kick him in the ass. Michael, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure, and I, I keep singularitizing. <laughs>